So we want to welcome our guest, John Kariaku, back to the show. John joined us on two previous Newsbeat episodes, one about the U.S. government's war on the press and the other about former CIA director Gina Haspel operating a black site and destroying evidence. And as Rashad reminded us, we actually go back much further, wow, about 10 years now, um, when we were back at an Alt Weekly uh, together way back in the day. Um, so for listeners who may not know, John's a former CIA analyst and case officer, former senior investigator for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and former counterterrorism consultant. While at the CIA, he conducted critical counterterrorism missions overseas following the September 11th terrorist attacks and refused to be trained in so-called enhanced interrogation techniques, something we'll get to in a few more moments. After leaving the CIA, he appeared on ABC News and confirmed that the agency waterboarded detainees, which is torture. He also revealed that this practice was not just the result of a few rogue agents, but official U.S. policy sanctioned at the highest levels of the government. He was indicted by the Obama administration under the Espionage Act, a law designed to punish spies, and served 30 months in prison as a result of those revelations. John's the sole CIA agent to go to jail in connection with the U.S. torture program, despite the fact he never tortured anyone, rather he blew the whistle on it. He currently writes about national security, intelligence, foreign affairs, and much more on his loud and clear Substack and co-hosts the daily radio show and podcast, Political Misfits. Hell of a resume. Uh, so yeah. John, <laughs> welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. Good to see you both. And uh, what I'd like to do uh, for listeners right off the bat is to, is, to, uh, is to talk about that journey we just outlined. So if you could paint us a portrait of what it means to be a whistleblower. Share, if you possibly can, you know, what this, what this whole ordeal has been like personally, professionally. You risked your life for this country, and then after exposing something internationally recognized as a crime against humanity, torture, you're indicted as a spy. Um, so if you could, you know, please describe the fallout, the toll it took on you and your family. And we're curious, given all that's happened, if you had the choice, would you do it all again? I'll, I'll answer that part first. That's the easy one. The answer is yes. 100% yes. 1000% yes. I'd do it today. Today. I've, I've realized that, that this, this sort of is my purpose in life. And, uh, Somebody had to say something. I'm glad that it was me. The more difficult answer is, it's not just what, what I experienced as a whistleblower. It's what any whistleblower experiences, especially a national security whistleblower. You know, we have a, we have a law in this country called the Whistleblower Protection Act, which specifically exempts national security whistleblowers from its protections. And so if you blow the whistle on waste, fraud, abuse, illegality, or threats to the public health or public safety, which is the legal definition of whistleblowing, and you work for the CIA, the FBI, NSA, DOD, the White House, or even the Department of Homeland Security, you're probably going to go to prison. And not just prison. You're probably going to be indicted under the Espionage Act. I'll get to that in a second because it's really important. Beyond that, you're going to be shocked at how many friends, in some cases lifelong friends, will walk away from you and never speak to you again. You're going to be shocked that the marriage that you thought was so rock solid turns out to not be so rock solid. Not when, you know, your wife is a senior CIA officer and is concerned about her own career. Uh, you're going to be shocked. And how quickly bankruptcy is upon you, which is the government's plan. They do something called, they do two things called venue shopping and charge stacking. Venue shopping is that they will seek to indict you in the federal district court that where they are, they are confident you will get a guilty verdict and the longest possible sentence. In my case, in the case of other national security whistleblowers, that's the Eastern District of Virginia, where no national security defendant has ever won a case there, ever. Um, and then you have to start thinking about 
the definition of espionage. The Espionage Act was written in 1917 to combat German saboteurs during the First World War. It has never been meaningfully updated. And in fact, the Espionage Act doesn't even mention classified information. It mentions only what it calls national defense information and then doesn't define what that means. So the secret that you're charged with exposing is whatever the Justice Department says it is, whether it's actually secret or not. In my case, my case set a very dangerous precedent or two. I had a hanging judge by the name of Leonie Brinkema. She was a Ronald Reagan, is a Ronald Reagan appointee. And um, she reserves most national security cases for herself. She did my case. She did uh, Jeffrey Sterling's case. She did Zacharias Musawi. She uh, had the Ed Snowden case, which is still open and hanging over his head. Uh, she had originally been assigned the Julian Assange case. So she keeps all these cases for herself. And um, in my case, um, I clearly had no criminal intent. And, um, and the Justice Department admitted in court that I had no criminal intent. And so my lawyer said, well, Your Honor, you know, Tom Drake, the NSA whistleblower, he was in the District of Maryland, no criminal intent. All those charges fell apart. They were thrown out. She says, I am electing to not respect that decision. And if you don't like it, you can go to the, circuit, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which, of course, you do post-conviction and post-incarceration. And I remember my lawyer standing up and saying, Your Honor, are you saying that a person can accidentally commit espionage? And she said, that's exactly what I'm saying. And she looked at me and she said, Mr. Kiriakou, either you did it or you didn't do it. And I think you did it. So we walked out of court. And as we were walking out, I said to my lawyers, I should add that we had made 110 motions for the declassification of documents that I needed to, to uh, 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 defend myself. And we had, we had blocked out two days for arguments on these 110 motions. And she said, I'm going to deny all 110 of these motions. All, all 110. You don't get anything. So I couldn't defend myself. So we're walking out of court. And I said to my lawyers, a-list lawyers, some of the best lawyers in America. I said, what just happened? And one of my attorneys said, we just lost the case. That's what happened. Well, this was like the first hearing. We, we have a year's worth of hearings ahead of us, which we would lose at every step of the way. Now, I was charged with five felonies, including three counts of espionage. Of course, I hadn't committed espionage. And so what the Justice Department did was um, they charged me, they waited till I went bankrupt, and then they dropped the charges. And one other thing, in the limited discovery that we did get, there was a memo from John Brennan, who became the CIA director, but at the time was the, uh, was the deputy national security advisor for counterterrorism. John and I always hated each other. We went back 30 years. And... Um, there's a memo from Brennan to Eric Holder, the attorney general, and he says, charge him with espionage. And Holder rates back and says, my people don't think he committed espionage. And then Brennan wrote back and said, charge him anyway and make him defend himself. And that's what they did. And then when I went bankrupt, uh, they, they dropped the charges. It's incredible, John. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. I, and I know even today, all these years later, it's still very emotional. Ugh. probably difficult for you to, to relive. So we do appreciate it. it. Um, just really quick before we get into the question, some, some of our other questions, including about Julian Assange. One of the things that I still can't believe about the Espionage Act is that it, it is one of the most undemocratic laws that we have on the books. And one of Edward Snowden's arguments for not wanting to actually come back to face trial is because you are not afforded, as you know, a public interest defense um, and yes. This, so I, I, I think this is this is important for listeners. Can you explain to people the undemocratic nature of this and why a public interest defense would be so helpful for people like yourself or 
the Snowdens or Assange if he was actually going to, you know, um, face prosecution rather than take a guilty plea. Why that's so important? Uh, that is such an important question. Uh, there is no affirmative defense in the Espionage Act. And courts over the last century have ruled that people cannot get up in court and say, I did it, but I did it in the public interest. Let me explain. You can't explain. As Judge uh, Brinkema said, you either did it or you didn't do it. Ed Snowden, I've talked to Ed about this at length. And he told me from the very beginning that he was willing to come home and he was willing to go to prison if he could get up in court and explain that what he did was in the interest of the American people. And so he hired my attorneys. I, I said, Ed, I have the best attorneys in America. You got to hire these guys. They, they only do white collar defense and national security. So he hired my lawyers and they began engaging the Justice Department in conversations, very preliminary conversations. Now, Ed told me on the QT, he was willing to go to prison for 10 years, 20 years, whatever it took. He knew what he was getting into and he did it for the public interest. So when the lawyers went to the Justice Department and said, look, he's willing to come home. And mind you, this is, you know, 11 years ago. He's willing to come home, but he wants he wants to make a statement in court. They said, absolutely not. So let me ask then, if you're a prosecutor at the Justice Department or you're an FBI agent in the counterintelligence division, isn't it important to you to take custody of this man who you have called the most dangerous man in America? Because he's offering to deliver himself to you. All he wants to do is to explain his actions. And they said, absolutely not. And so they never got him. Yeah. So yes, you know, over the, over the years, over the century, the last century, the, the uh, Espionage Act has been used to imprison Eugene V. Debs, popular presidential candidate, uh, a Hollywood producer who, who produced a movie that was deemed to be not pro-British enough and then ended up getting like a decade in prison. Uh, and, and one other thing, and I apologize in advance for throwing a, a, a number at you, but, but between the creation, the, the founding of the Espionage Act and the election of Barack Obama, three people, three Americans were charged with espionage for speaking to the press. Just under Obama, eight of us were charged with espionage for speaking to the press, not for spying for other countries, not for taking money for sensitive information, but for going to the media and saying the American government is committing war crimes and here are the details. That's what gets you locked up. Yep, it's incredible. And so speaking of locked up while not in the U.S., but um, in self-imposed imprisonment, at, at the Ecuadorian embassy in the UK, and then also in a UK prison um, as he awaited an extradition hearing. Julian Assange, obviously, um, a few weeks ago, accepted a guilty plea in his Espionage Act case, which I still can't believe was brought because under the Obama administration, which obviously Biden played a huge hand in, uh, that DOJ, which was aggressive against everybody, including yourself, um, decided they couldn't bring charges against Assange. They had a quote, New York Times problem if they did. Yet That's right. the Trump administration does it. Biden continues with the prosecution and he takes his guilty plea. And Chris and I were sort of stunned with the um, the way that this was being discussed. Yes, it was great to us that Assange was finally being released. He'd go back to his family. It's a win for him, especially because of his physical, um, mental, and his health conditions just overall. Yet the government still, in our view, got a guilt a conviction, essentially, under the Espionage Act for a publisher, a journalist, setting a hugely a, a dangerous precedent that will live on forever. We can never yeah. go back um, from that. We'll never return from that. So, Well, um, there's disagreement about that. Sure. Um, that, but that, that it, was my, my position was the same it, as yours. Yeah, I was going to ask you what your position was, John, because yeah. I know there's disagreement, but I'm just wondering what your position is. And if you want to bring up what, you know, what other people say about that, that notion that a, a guilty plea is different than a, a conviction and it's not a precedent. 
and and that's really it. I was talking to Chip Gibbons about this the other day. Uh, Chip is a is a great. She's an attorney and a great champion of of not just civil liberties, but also of the scrapping and rewriting of the uh, Espionage Act. And I expressed exactly the same concerns that you just expressed. And he said, well, not necessarily. First of all, um, even though it technically falls under the Espionage Act, he didn't plead guilty to espionage. He pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage. Okay, well, all right. I'm not a lawyer. What do I know? But he said, because it was a plea deal, future prosecutors can't use it to leverage the indictment of another journalist. And I said, okay, well, all right, I get that too. But let me give you some background that I think you'll have fun with. I um, I am a very proud longtime supporter of both Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And... um. And I made three trips to Iceland to meet with WikiLeaks uh, in December, January, and and February uh, this year to strategize uh, with attorneys and and activists and journalists. We were all expecting that Julian would be would be extradited to uh, to the Eastern District of Virginia and face trial there. Now Julian also had some of the best legal minds that money could buy on the payroll in, in the form of Barry Pollack here in the, in, in Washington, Barry's legendary. And, um, and Barry never gave up hope because he knew that he had the facts on his side. He also knew that public opinion plays at least as great a role in, in people's convictions as the facts do. And the biggest problem that Julian had was that almost everybody who considers himself or herself to be a Democrat blames Julian Assange for giving us Donald Trump, right? And they were just convinced that he wasn't going to get a fair trial. It just wasn't possible to get a fair trial. Julian also didn't trust the Justice Department to um, to uh, respect the agreement. And that's why, see, there was they were at loggerheads for a long time because... Justice insisted that Julian be brought to Alexandria, Virginia, um, that he take the plea in the Eastern District of Virginia and then be expelled to Australia. And he said, no. He said, I don't believe them. I don't trust them. And if they lock me up, I'm going to kill myself. And so the deal that Barry Pollock was able to negotiate was that they process him in the federal district that is closest, physically closest to Australia. And that was Saipan, Northern Mariana Islands. I had no idea there was a federal court there, seriously. And it all worked out. You know, there was one odd provision. And it was funny because the Justice Department just cackled with the light that it was this great victory for them. And it made me laugh that they're just such idiots. Um. Part of the the agreement was that he had to promise not to publish any unpublished material that originated with Chelsea Manning. And he had to swear out an affidavit saying that he didn't have any and that WikiLeaks had to purge from its systems any unpublished material from Chelsea Manning. Well, there is no unpublished material from Chelsea Manning. Now, interestingly... The CIA didn't demand that anything about Vault 7 and Vault 8 needed to be purged or anything about Russian troll farms that WikiLeaks has exposed or the Church of Scientology that's on the website. You know, people think, oh, well, you know, WikiLeaks, it's a Russian front organization and uh, Julian Assange, he's a Russian agent and all they do is they try to uncover American secrets. People who say that have never been to the WikiLeaks website. They've never looked to see what it is that WikiLeaks is revealing because they reveal protected information from all around the world in the public interest. You know, I'm I'm thrilled that Julian is free. That was the goal. And I don't care so much about a conspiracy charge. And he's, he's banned from applying for an American green card for 25 years. It's like, great. That's great. Great punishment. Um, but the important we'll say the is, suggestion that they they 
don't produce or reproduce anything in their possession as a journalistic outfit to me is also insulting, but you know, it is, it's insulting. That's right. But I'm glad he's home with his wife and his kids and you know, his mom, his dad, his brother. It, it's, it's better this way. John, you know, just on the topic of Julian and yourself, you know, again, back to just the whole whistleblower being a whistleblower, you know, I mean, all of the things that, that Assange has exposed, um, all the things that you've exposed. Um, if we could talk a little bit about just how frustrating is it for you uh, that in your case, you know, they went after you, yet the people who were actually committing the crimes yeah. um, weren't even pursued. And in fact, we're celebrating in some cases. We mentioned Gina Haspel at the, at the, at the top of the episode here. Who are some of the people that it just still sits with you like, those are the people who should have been held accountable. Yeah. Wow. Let's make a list. Number one is Jose Rodriguez, uh, the former deputy director for operations at the CIA, the former director of the, of the uh, counterterrorism center and Gina Haspel's uh, boss and, uh, and rabbi at the CIA. It was, it was Jose who implemented the torture program. It was Jose who ordered the training for the torturers. And then when word started getting out, it was Jose who ordered that the tapes of the torture sessions be destroyed after being specifically told by the White House counsel, don't destroy the tapes. And not only did he destroy them, I mean, it's not like he put them on a magnet or something. He had them thrown into an industrial grinder so that they were pulverized and couldn't possibly be recovered. So my own personal view is that Jose is a, a war criminal and should face international charges. Uh, there are several people whose names you wouldn't recognize around Jose, whose careers rose with Jose's, who should be in the same dock in The Hague. Uh, Jim Pavitt, the former deputy director of the CIA for, uh, for operations, uh, died a year and a half ago. He should have been in the dock. Uh, George Tenet. Listen, George is a nice guy, right? Great hero of the Greek American community, but George is a war criminal. Uh, what did he get? He got a $6 million book advance and a position on the board of directors of a, of a vulture fund in New York City. He has more money than he can possibly count in a lifetime. So, yeah, I was angry about, about a lot of that for a long time. But, you know, after a period of time, you, you come to the realization that you're right and they're wrong, right? I can sleep at night. My kids are proud of me. I like the person that I am. And I know that history will smile on me, you know, when I'm dead and gone and people are studying this period. You know, in December of 2014, I was still in prison. I had about six weeks to go. And I called my wife. I was allowed to call her for 15 minutes every other day. And I said, hey, how's your day? She said, it's great. And I said, really? Great? Why is it great? And she said, because the Senate torture report was released today. And it proved that everything you said was true. She said, John McCain got up on the floor of the Senate and said, you were an American hero and that the American people would never have known what the U.S. government was doing in their name had you not told them. It was worth it. And it was. It was worth it. So, you know, the likes of Jose, they can have their little retirement homes in St. Augustine, Florida. I don't care. I can sleep at night and know that I'm not a war criminal with the blood of hundreds or perhaps thousands of people on my hands. Yeah, definitely. And John, the, uh, you know, we like to continuously bring up these stories because, you know, the war on terror is still going on. We're still, yes. the surveillance state is still being expanded and heavily funded. Um, they're finding new ways to find way, you know, to, to yes. surveil American citizens and people abroad. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the Senate torture report. I spoke, uh, we briefly spoke to you yesterday and I talked about how that was the first story I wrote about you back in December, 2014, when that was released. Right. Because 
because the torture report was heavily uh, reliant on the story of Abu Zubaida, who was yes. accused of being in, uh, uh, I think, the third ranking member of Al Qaeda, yes. which if, if I'm right, but then they, yes. they years later, they re basically retracted that. Um, Wasn't true. Yep. And he's being held in Guantanamo still. Um, there's an update to his case. Um, mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, I believe that you were not only part of the operation that led to his capture in Pakistan, mm -hmm. um, but you also either interviewed him or you were with him after the capture. If I, maybe I hope I have those yeah, details I, correct. I, I led the capture yep. and then I, I sat with him for 56 hours. After he was captured. Right. Yeah. So I bring this up because he is petitioning to be released by a mil I think a military review board. Um, tribunal, and yeah. I don't I don't know if that if there's been an update on that case. I'm assuming mm -hmm. you've been following it. Um yeah. I bring him up because he's basically exemplifies all that's gone wrong. Um since then, he was the first person to be um waterboarded uh, and yes. some of these torture techniques used against him, effectively a guinea pig. Um he was yes. rendered, thrown in Guantanamo. Um, to uh, to the American public, you bring up, you know, maybe some people don't know him. Other people's, he's just like scum of the earth because they think mm -hmm. he was involved. Um, um, can you just, if you have any update on, on Zubayeta's case, do you mind mentioning that? And can you just uh, just um, sort of talk about him as sort of like the example of of everything that sort of went wrong at that in that period? Sure, I d and I do have an update. Um... So in December of 2002, I was the chief of counterterrorism operations in Pakistan for the CIA. And we got word that Abu Zubaydah was somewhere in Pakistan. We had to take him alive. He was identified to us as the number three in Al Qaeda. I'm going to make a very, very long story, very short and say, number one, he was not the number three in Al Qaeda. He was never even a member of Al Qaeda. He was a bad guy. He um, created, uh, uh, founded Al-Qaeda's uh, safe house in Peshawar, Pakistan, the House of Martyrs. He founded Al-Qaeda's two training camps in southern Afghanistan, in Helmand and, um, and uh, Kandahar provinces. And he acted as something of a, of a logistician. If you wanted to go to Afghanistan to fight, he would get you across the border. If you were tired of the fight and wanted to go home, he would get a false passport and a plane ticket and send you home. Um, but he had never joined Al-Qaeda. He was not the number three in Al-Qaeda. He had never pledged fealty to Osama bin Laden. And he had literally nothing to do with 9-11. Nothing. But we tortured him mercilessly in violation of both U.S. and international law. He was held at a series of six secret prisons all around the world where he was tortured at black sites and then finally sent to Guantanamo. And even after the, the government reluctantly admitted, eh, he really wasn't the number three in Al Qaeda. They still didn't want to let him go. Why? Because he knew too much about CIA methods, right? The act of torture was classified. Currently and properly classified is the, is the phrase that the CIA uses all the time. Even his drawings, he drew sketches of himself being tortured. Those were classified and kept from the public. So Abu Zubaydah has been in American custody since March 28th, 2002. That's a long time. A long time. He was a kid when I captured him. Now he's on the back end of middle age and he's never been charged with a crime. Well, the constitution says we all have a right to face a, a jury of our peers and to face our accusers in a court of law. He's never been given those rights. And so my mantra for years has been that he must be released. He must be released. And I've gone so far as to go onto Twitter and to apologize because I know that the government won't. So I apologize to him sort of in absentia for this illegal and inhuman and immoral treatment. Now, with that said, I spoke to his lead attorney a week ago and, uh, and he said a couple of funny things. He said something that really made me feel great. He said that when I went public, 
in 2007, word immediately got around the prisoners at Al Qaeda that a CIA man had confirmed what they had been alleging. They said a friendly guard told them that I had blown the whistle on the torture program. He said it was like giving them new life. Uh, that made me very happy. The lawyer also said that Abu Zubaydah has some different recollections of our encounter that night back in 2002. Um, but that he looks forward to the two of us having dinner together as free men. And that also means a lot. You know, the, the media have made a great deal about, well, you know, could he be expelled to Saudi Arabia? He's Palestinian, but he was born in Saudi Arabia. Well, he couldn't be expelled to Saudi Arabia or to Yemen or that's not the way these things work, these releases. You know, over the years, we've released hundreds of prisoners from Guantanamo, almost all of whom have been innocent of any crime. And if they can go back to their country, they go back to their country. But in the case of Abu Zubaydah, he has no country. And so what we've done with other Palestinians or with prisoners who can't be returned to their home countries because it would be too dangerous for them there, they would be tortured or killed or harassed or, you know, the intelligence service would be on them. They go to places like Tahiti, Albania, Switzerland, uh, Belize, Costa Rica, uh, Thailand. So what's happening now is there are dual negotiations underway. Number one is between Abu Zubaydah's legal team and the Justice Department, where they're looking for some crime that he can plead guilty to, right? Conspiracy to provide material support to terrorism. I'm just making that up. Something. So that he'll plead guilty, he'll be found guilty, sentenced to time served, and expelled. The second negotiation is with a wide variety of countries with the wherewithal to be able to handle somebody who's as high, high profile as Abu Zubaydah is. Abu Zubaydah probably can't go to a place like Belize because the Belizeans, they, I mean, I don't even know how many people there are in Belize, let alone how many people in the National Police or the Intelligence Service. But if he could go to someplace like Mohamed Oud Slahi, for example, is, is now uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, or there are prisoners in, former prisoners in Italy who have been welcomed. Switzerland, as I said. So if, if they can negotiate the plea and negotiate a relocation package, this thing might actually come to an end. Thank God. Oh, wow. you know what? Let me add one more thought. One of the important things about the Senate torture report, which was actually not really the Senate torture report, it's a heavily redacted 500-page executive summary of the 5,000-page Senate torture report. One of the important things is in the footnotes, right? So it's very heavily redacted to really understand what the CIA did to these people. You have to read the footnotes. And there's, there's a footnote there that I've quoted many times in my own writing where the CIA said that Abu Zubaydah would never be released under any circumstances. He would never be permitted to um, communicate with the outside world. And when he died at Guantanamo, he was to be cremated and his ashes cast into the Caribbean. That's not the CIA's decision to make. The CIA is not a law enforcement organization. It's not up to them to make that call. And so it looks like maybe after all these years, the government is finally coming to the realization we need to end this thing. My God, that's incredible. Terrible. Um, uh, yeah, horrific. Um, speaking of horrific and, and just more you know, indefinite detention and torture, um, we're curious to get your thoughts on these latest reports um, coming out of the conflict um, with Israel 
uh, yeah. regarding these makeshift sort of detainment camps and prisons. Um, CNN had a report recently where a whistleblower, Israeli whistleblower, um, leaked details of forced amputations, um, mm -hmm. women and children being held there. There's reports of mass rapes, sexual abuse. Um, we spoke with um, former DOD official uh, Mark Fallon a couple weeks ago, just in the context of, of you know, Israel has has stated, you know, this is, they're, they're taking this as the, the October 7th attacks as their sort of 9-11. Um, and, and he, you know, warned about the proliferation of, of sort of more enemies and combatants regarding their response. Um, so what's your, what's your thoughts on this? What specifically about these, these torture camps that are, that are coming out? Yeah. Uh, allegedly there's I, I, the number I, I had seen was over 10,000 potential prisoners there. Um, and what needs to be done? I saw that number two. First of all, let me say, if Mark Fallon says it, you can believe it. Um, he's, he's a great truth teller. And, um, I've heard the same reports. Um, there are doctors reporting back to the United Nations on the inordinate number of amputations that are taking place, um, among Palestinian prisoners, uh, unnecessary amputations, because if you cut off their legs, they can't run after you with a, you know, a bomb strapped to them, right? Or you cut off their arms, they can't find, they can't fire a gun. I mean, the most grotesque human rights violations imaginable. And it's even worse than that. I spoke to an Israeli uh, human rights attorney mm, two or three weeks ago who, who represents only Palestinians in Israeli prisons. And he said, as soon as October 7th took place, the entire Israeli prison system enacted a new uh, regulation that Palestinians who are incarcerated are not permitted to walk. Meaning, to get from point A to point B, you have to crawl on your hands and knees. You want to go to the cafeteria? Crawl on, on your hands and knees. He said, you can do that for 10 minutes. You can't do it for a year and a half. And if you object, if you speak in more than a whisper, you're beaten with a truncheon or a piece of rebar, they'll break your legs, they'll break your arms, and then God forbid, they'll amputate them because they become infected. So I think this is an absolutely hideous human rights, ongoing human rights violation that the entire world is overlooking, they're choosing to overlook. And criminally, the U.S. government has elected to just pretend it's not happening. Yeah, John. So um, we we went back just to see what you what you have going on. And as as Chris mentioned at, at, up top, it's a, it's a lot. Um, but you did report on an interesting story that I wasn't even aware of, and I think everybody would find interesting. I I, I couldn't believe it. Um, you reported on the National Archives, um, which is obviously has to protect founding documents and plays an instrum in instrumental role in declassification. But you found out that really that's not been the case in recent years, partly due to defunding and partly due to what seems like just like they don't want to do it, really. <laughs> they don't want to actually um, perform their function. Um, can you tell listeners about the story with the National Archives? I mean, we're laughing, but it is a, it is a serious story. You know, honest to God, I forgot I wrote that until you just mentioned it. Uh, yeah, this is a serious story. So the National Archives, of course, is the is the ultimate repository of literally every document that's produced by a U.S. government employee, right? Especially classified documents. Now, we have a mandatory declassification law in this country that says that every document should be declassified after 30 or 35 years, it's called statutory declassification. The thing is, is you need a human being to actually read it after 30 or 35 years to say, okay, yeah, this stuff isn't still classified. So um, it should be, we can declassify it and put it on the website. But the problems are several. Number one, Archives is using a computer system that's 20 years old. It's just not updated. Number two, the head of archives has asked for a smaller fed, federal budget. 
Who does that? Like ever in the history of America. Like, you know what? My agency needs less money next year. And so year after year after year after year, there's no computer upgrade. Number three, that computer system has no connectivity with any other governmental organization because it's so many generations behind the times. So if somebody from the State Department says, oh, you know, we've got these documents, we're going to send them over to you. They have to like physically put them in the mail and double wrap them and send them hard copy to the National Archives because there's no internet connectivity. And number four, and this is the worst part of it, because of all these problems, there's something like a 500 year wait for the fulfillment of Freedom of Information Act requests. It's like you can file a Freedom of Information Act request and the law says that they have 30 days to tell you that they've received your request and then they have 90 days to answer the request. But there's a 500 year wait because there's just nobody to actually do the work. It, it just doesn't exist. I'll give you just one typical example. Um, in 2015, I wanted to write an article about a guy, popular science fiction writer from the 1950s, who may have worked for NSA, he may have worked for CIA, um, but all the while was writing these Hollywood you know, B-movies uh, under a pseudonym. So I said, "Here, the guy's dead. Here's his name. Here's a copy of his death certificate. And I would just like to know, was he a CIA or NSA employee between 1950 and 1954? And if so, you know, please tell me about his career. So I got a letter back. I got an email back uh, also in 2015 saying that um, they had received the request. But that was nine years ago. I never heard anything again. And so I wrote a, an email to the CIA a year ago, and I said, hey, you guys ignored this request. You had 180 days or, or 90 days to respond to it. And here we, it's nine years later, I have no response. And they said, oh, you are in the line to be answered but at the current rate, it's going to be about 30 more years. And, and you know what? You say, well, you guys are violating the law. And they say, call your congressman. You know, I mean, I mean, John, I mean, just hearing that. Right. I mean, <laughs> how convenient for them. Right. I mean, you got to. Oh, sure. I'm not I'm not trying to be conspiratorial here, but it's like, you know, it's like. Is it is it just lapse of you know funding and mis and gross mismanagement, or is that just deliberately so they don't have to fulfill these requests? I mean, it's incredible. I'll, I'll tell you another quick story. When when I was an analyst, I was like a mid career analyst, and I was asked to be the acting deputy national intelligence officer for the Middle East. Right, it's kind of a big deal. It's it's handling the Middle East for the entire. Uh, intelligence community. And I did this for six weeks. It was a six week rotation. So I go up there. Uh, it's on the seventh floor of the CIA, the, the executive floor. And I was all gung ho, you know, I'm going to write a paper about Saddam Hussein. I'm going to write a paper about, you know, whatever. And they said, no, we want you to work on these freedom of information act requests. So just go through, uh, these documents and black out everything that's classified. Well, the stack of documents was literally eight feet tall. And this was just for this one national intelligence officer for the Middle East. It was eight feet tall. I worked 12 hour days, six days a week for the entirety of that six weeks to go through every one of those documents and say, these are old, they're historical, they're not important. Nobody cares about the Suez crisis and what, you know, John Foster Dulles said to his brother about the Suez crisis. It's all for the historians. So almost none of it was classified. And then the NIO said, you saved me 10 years worth of work. And I said, but I mean, there, there shouldn't be any backlog for FOIA. We should have an army of FOIA people, hire retirees to come in and just get the, the American people own this information. They should have access to it. 
scholars should have ready access to it. And nobody does. Incredible. But if you want to give the filmmakers behind Zero Dark Thirty, oh, behind then. the scenes. Don't get me just, started. Just, just speak to your favorite uh, mm-hmm. national security officer. That's right. And there will be no for implications for that. And if you're a CIA analyst, you get a Rolex and tickets to the premiere in exchange. Yeah, yep. nice. That's incredible. Um, mm-hmm. John, I mean, yeah, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. We always My appreciate pleasure. the time that you you give us. I know you're a busy busy person, but uh, you know Thank we can speak you. to you. We can speak to you for hours on any range of in- issues uh, that come up. Um, Thanks for your good questions. So, Thank you. Y- you know, it's it's always great. So we really appreciate you taking some time out and doing this awesome. with us. Thanks for having me. Good to see you both.